Hey guys, it's Ted Boward with The Ted Show. We're running a little bit behind today. Thanks for being patient. Um, all my fault, as usual. I am with my friend, Sal Picatagio. Hey. All right, I did it. Hey, hey what's hey. up? Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, we've had a great conversation. He's got fantastic energy. And we're going to talk today about um, the American Dream 2020. We're going to talk about immigration. Uh, business, how you can become a business owner as an immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, touch on a lot of cool things. He ha he is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, he does presentations. He even has people open up for him, which is <laughs> a big deal. Uh, but we, we really want to talk about this in this day and age. We've got a lot of negativity that goes on in our world about immigration and immigrants. And so what a cool thing to be able to focus on the positive. So Absolutely. welcome to the show, Sal. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So they love to hear, everybody wants to know about you. So if you can give them a little background, maybe your origin story. Sure. Thank you. Your sure. origin story, you know, kind of how your, your journey to get here, because you are an attorney and we're going to get to that yep. too. Yeah. So I'm an immigration attorney. I've been practicing only in the Orlando area since 2011. Uh, before that, I was at the University of Florida College of Law, Go, Go Gators, Gators. Go Gators uh, <laughs> where I met my wife. She's an attorney also. Uh, before that, I was also at the University of Florida for undergrad. Uh, I was there for those years, for all of you Gators out there, for the back-to-back -back basketball championships and the two football championships. <laughs> Great time to oh, be in Oh, you had a great Ooh, time. Oh my goodness. That's a good time to be in the yeah, swamp. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, and where I did public relations, and as Ted and I were talking, I was a musician as well. So I, yeah, That's when I have right. presentations. Drums. Now, yes, play the drums. And uh, so when I have openers, when I do presentations now, it just gives me flashbacks to those days. Um, <laughs> before that, I grew up in South Florida. I grew up in Coral Springs, Florida, which is not Coral Gables by Miami. It's more of a- Broward. Yeah, Broward, a suburb of, kind of like right next to Boca. Little, uh, little south of that, right on the edge of the Everglades there. Uh, big fan of the, uh, the Sawgrass Mills Mall. If you're familiar with the, uh, <laughs> totally. the giant outlet mall down there. And, uh, and the Florida Panthers, one of like seven people in all of Florida who like hockey. So what's up with that hockey? You like hockey sports, fans? though. Yeah, yeah, I do. He's I, uh, against sports yeah, and law. A little bit of everything. You're like a renaissance man. I, I, I know. Is that why your wife was attractive? Or was it the drums? You know, w the first night we met was at the University of Florida Law School's Law student talent show, which was a thing. They still do. It's called Lala Palooza. Of course, it's called <laughs> of course, right. Lala Palooza. And uh, the band I was in at the time, they had asked us to to close out the night because we can do a full set. So you know, we'll, we'll close out the night after everyone does their bits, and we'll have you guys play for half an hour. And we were all there. We had just gotten our band shirts in. We had ordered shirts with the logo on them. Uh, the name of the band was Superfish. It didn't mean anything. It was just a fun word. So we had we were all wearing the shirts because we were so happy we got them. And my wife and I, at the time, we were friends on Facebook, but neither of us knew who friended the other. I maintain she friended me, she maintains the opposite. But either way. Typical attorney. Right. Uh, and <laughs> so I knew, we had kind of know each other, so I just walked up to her and said, hey, we're friends, right? And we just started up a conversation, and then it went on from there. Yeah. Love it. And you're married, you have a baby. Yes, we have well, a two-year-old. No, she's a baby, but she's a big baby. Uh, so I, I think they'll be watching this later. Hi, Caroline. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right, so what got you into law? What was the, did, did you come from a family of attorneys or? Yeah, uh, I didn't actually. So I got into law, well, okay, so we've been joking how I'm an old, older millennial. I'm on that older end of the millennial. So that's when everyone was graduating college and there weren't any jobs and no one knew what to do. So law <laughs> school seemed to be the option. Uh, I'd always thought I would go to law school, but in terms of finding immigration, that was just kind of something that happened kind of because we all just needed jobs. We all were trying to figure out what we can do. I actually took a lot of intellectual property classes, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. I took one immigration class my very last semester of law school with who ended up hiring me for my first job, uh, Ed Bashara. He's practicing in Maitland. Yeah, he's been practicing immigration for a long time. But you had no, no idea when you go to law school what you wanted to practice. I did not, okay, I so. did not. And some people did, some people didn't, and some people switched really hard. Uh, they thought they were gonna do one thing, they ended up practicing something totally different and loving it or switching around. And that's, that's kind of my generation of lawyers, especially in Florida, seem to have, seem to have done, where it's, hey, we, we were getting by with whatever we can get and they figured out their career from there. So when you're touched by immigration, when all of a sudden that becomes, because it's, it's feast or famine, you're trying to figure out what you're doing, yeah. 
What was the reason behind you going, all right, I can actually dive deep into this. I like this. I yeah. understand why this is an important area of law. Well, it was knowing that something that we call business immigration even existed. So like many folks, they think immigration is, I got a job in the United States or I'm marrying a US citizen, right. uh, or it's you were here as a visitor and you're getting kicked out or something, deportation. That's kind of the pop culture knowledge of what immigration is. You see it in movies, of, you know, doing the marriage interview, do we really love each other? We need to be living together for a long time. 90 Day Fiance. Is 90, 90, about 90 Day Fiance. Uh, <laughs> I, I refuse, I will not watch it, can't, too real. Um, the last season of Orange is the New Black had a really heavy immigration subplot and it was hard, it was hard for me to see that played out um, on, on, a, on a show like that, it was wild. Um, so for me, learning that business immigration was really a thing. That was the class I took in law school. Uh, it was a, just a purely business immigration class where I learned about investors, entrepreneurs, managers and executives, people with extraordinary abilities who are coming to the United States to continue that work. Uh, there's so many different types. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. I can do something like that. I love that. And I think that a lot of people, we were talking before the show, it's not that you can just say I'm from Uzbekistan, I'm making up a country, and decide that you want to come do business here. There are... Uh, rules and oh, laws yeah. oh, that yeah. we have in place. Yes, mm -hmm. we do have laws and rules in place. Yes. We were talking about that earlier too. And there are processes that you have to go through. There's a real process for you to be able to come here and do business, to open a business. And there's many different levels oh, yeah. of that. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the process. I think people, like I said, think that they can just go, I'm going to establish a business in the United States. And that's sort of where you get that particular mindset of, it's super easy to come in here and get into the United States right. and taking jobs away and all right. of that insanity. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the process. Yeah. So especially for the business owners and the entrepreneurs and the investors, so they do have to set up a real operating United States business. They're not coming here and buying a green card. They're not just saying, I'm dumping a bunch of money into the United States, please give me a green card. Uh, there are some countries around the world where you can just invest in real estate not, and not even really be a living there that much, and you can get their country's green card even as far as going as citizenship. But here in the United States, it's you are creating a real operating, legal term, bona fide business that is actually going to provide goods and services for profit and ideally create jobs, uh, which was always a thing, uh, even before the Buy American, Hire American policy that uh, the president dropped on us in 2017. It was always the idea where jobs needed to be created because all the different types of business immigration process is either implicitly or explicitly required in any way. Some, like the EB-5 program, the Immigrant Investor Program, specifically 10 jobs. You need to do 10 jobs with your investment or else you're not getting the green card. So you create, so EB-5 is a, I'm used to that word, mm -hmm. I've heard that around. I've worked with real estate professionals who are working with foreign investors that want to yeah. come on. And so what you're saying is that part of the process, in order for you to qualify for an EB-5, you have to show that you're going to create 10 jobs here. Yes, 10 full-time jobs for American citizens or permanent residents. The investor, him or herself, does not count. Their family members do not count. And those jobs can be either directly in the business they're investing in. So say they were building a hotel with their investment. So the, a, the employees of the hotel itself would count. But also through different styles of EB-5, uh, we call it a regional center project because they're affiliated with a regional center, and if you have follow-up questions, I'll explain what that is. Uh, they can count actually indirect and induced jobs. So not just the jobs in the hotel cool. itself, but because this capital is now here, how many people around the area are gonna find jobs? How many new positions are gonna be created? And it's, a, it's, a, it's an expenditure model. So money's going in, an economist puts it through a fancy mathematical formula, and out comes X amount of jobs. <laughs> And so let me just clarify, I know the answer to this, but I'm going to play dumb, which I'm really good at. <laughs> uh, you come in, you say, I want an EB-5, Sal, so next month I am 100% going to open my business and I'm in. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, you can open up a business and you can apply in maybe a month or two, but processing times are going to get you. And that's the situation with immigration right now is that everything's taking a really, 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 really long time so EB-5 right now average processing times are between two and four years and that doesn't give you any right to be in the country while you're waiting you would need some other type of temporary status while you're waiting for the EB-5 to get approved so you can put the money in 
you can start the business. The business can open its doors. You can have a manager running things, but the investor, him or herself, cannot hang here and manage it or operate it or do anything other than what their old status was until this two or four years goes by. And then they can actually apply for their green card because all green card processes are actually two steps. The qualification, like the investment, the job creation, and then I actually want a green card where they look into your residence history, your legal history, your medical history. Uh, have you ever received weapons training? Do you sell drugs? Do you know anyone who sells drugs? Are you a terrorist? Are you committing crimes? That kind of stuff. So I have to read a comment. Great show. Your guest is very qualified as an immigration attorney. He's Thank you. darn good looking too. Oh yeah, he's my son. Hello, Hi, Dad. Dad. Hi, Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, Every bit of that. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> I've been posting about this. I've been sharing that. Uh, I was going to be on all week. And I talked on the phone the other day. He's like, tell me about it. What is this? I want to know about it. <laughs> like, right, you're going to watch it. Right. <laughs> but I, I think the point that you're making is that we do have steps and rules and laws in place. Oh, yeah. So when you're listening to certain mainstream media, it isn't the reality. The reality is there are uh, checks and balances. There are things that have to be met, milestones that have oh, yeah. to be met. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's not as easy a process. So if you're determined to come here, do business here, be a part of the U.S. economy, uh, get your green card, it's not just that I'm going to cut a check, open a business, and now I have a green card. Yeah, there's a lot of things you need to do to maintain the qualifications. And it's, it's not, yeah, it's not that easy. It's not that fast. And there's no one way to do it. The common thing I always hear is, why don't people do it the right way? Or why don't they just get in line? And there's no one right way, and there's no one line. In business immigration alone, uh, if, if you've seen my presentation before, I have a slide where I have a, two columns with temporary and permanent statuses, and there's about five or six options on each side. And if there's no one real simple way to do it, there's ways that are a little more straightforward than others, but it depends on the person who's sitting in my office or who I'm on the phone with or I'm on WhatsApp with who's saying, here's what I want to do, here's my situation, Either I have a business overseas or I don't, or I have investment funds available or I don't, or I want to come in right away, or I'm able to be more patient. Maybe I have a job offer. Maybe my education is really advanced. There's all these different things I need to consider before deciding on a path. And it may not just be one step. It may be, maybe there's a temporary status we can get you into now and convert that to a green card later on. So it's a lot of planning that goes into it. A ton of planning. You know, one of the things that I love about talking about immigration is, uh, and it's not necessarily the most popular thought process right now, but I believe the country was built on the backs and the dreams of immigrants yeah. here. And we've always been such an accepting country for that. Uh, in the current climate, it seems like it's not as acceptable. When you're talking to people who want to come over and want to do an EB-5 or want to do an LZ-2 on the <laughs> or whatever, uh, are they still as excited and thrilled and have that American dream spirit from around the world uh, regardless of what's going on internally in our country? Yeah, there's still a lot of excitement and passion about doing it and doing it the right way. And that's when I have those prospects who I talk to, those consultations where they say, I just really want to do it the right way. Whatever that right way is, help me do it the right way. I just want to do it. This is my dream. This is my goal. It's for myself and often it's for the family. It's I want my kids to uh, go to school in the United States, but I, I know I need to contribute in some way. I know I can bring something myself for the betterment of me, for my family, for the country. There's so much that we could do. Uh, they're still positive. And then the frustration comes in when we have to have the real conversation on, here's how long it's gonna take, and here are the very specific and sometimes expensive and time-consuming steps that it takes. And those unfortunately have gotten more expensive and more time-consuming and more difficult over the last I'll pick a time out of a hat, last three years or so, roughly the beginning of 2017, things started getting a lot harder. And that is frustrating to people, but that's why folks like me are out there. They're immigration attorneys, and unfortunately there's some people who think they're immigration attorneys. <laughs> Gotta be careful about that. Um, the CIA, Just like uh, any attorneys yeah, or any, any experts. Right, um, the uh, Immigration Service, uh, USCIS, so if I use that acronym a bunch, it's the Immigration Service they have a campaign, they call it the wrong help can hurt. And there's folks out there, these types of services where they're not licensed barred attorneys, because this is a process of law, you mentioned it earlier. There are laws, the Immigration and Nationality Act is a thing. The Code of Federal Regulations, 8 CFR 212 and 214, 
these, these exist. These are real laws and regulations and policies that I need to interpret. And it's not just filling out a form. And that's a lot. That's another huge misconception. Oh, it's, I'm just filling out a form. I'm going to fill out the form. I'm going to send in some stuff. I'm going to get my green card. Everything you put in that form, or even everything you don't put on that form, that's in compliance with some type of law or regulation Correct. or policy. It all has legal consequences. So someone saying, oh, I'm just helping you fill out a form. I'm not giving you legal advice. Well, they kind of are. So you got to you gotta be careful with everything you send over to immigration because it's you got to set that foundation real early that I'm doing it the right way from the very first thing I submit, either here in the United States or going through the U.S. consulate back at the country you're from. Everything has to be done so carefully, so as perfect as you can get it from step one or else it's going to have a lot of problems down the road. I think we talked, we talked about earlier how you don't realize that the people that your favorite restaurant, your favorite server, your favorite business you do business with, uh, so many of them are either immigrants or touched by immigrants mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. have dealt with the immigration process. Right. And so to just blanket say that we're trying to close our shores, I'm not going to get political, but I just want people to know that there are really positive ways in place that you can do the things that you want to do. So I want to encourage. Uh, immigrants to step up and do what you want to do, live the dream, yeah. the American dream. Exactly. One of the questions I posed earlier was, uh, don't you love supportive family members who want to see you succeed? Yes, thank you, Melissa, absolutely. Uh, I think that one of the things- Thanks again, Dad. I want to, <laughs> yeah, thanks again, Dad, we love Dad. Um, I think that people do love success stories, and yeah. pe I asked him the question when I, when I posted your picture this morning, are you living the American dream? Because I think a lot of people go, well, they just want to come and they want to capitalize on the American dream. Well, isn't that what the American dream is about? Aren't we here to make sure that everybody's successful? Right. We're an amazing country overall, the best on the planet, in my opinion. I love our country, and I, I know that we offer so many amazing opportunities that other countries don't have for their citizens. So why would we judge the people who are coming in to live that American dream when we're not living it ourselves? And so mm. I just want to mm. encourage you to really think about whether you're living it, and if somebody else is, give them kudos and give them yeah. thanks instead of yeah. um, judging them. So we were talking also earlier about how I'm 100% sure I would fail the citizenship test. And so we're gonna do a fun show about that later, but. Tell people a little bit about that process because I also think that people, uh, well, you're here, you should be a citizen. I like that, I, I agree. I want people to become a citizen so they're not dealing with the rest of this yeah. insanity they're dealing with. Right. That's my main goal for them. Uh, but it's not that easy either. You still have to study, you have to want it, you have to go, go forth and do good. I would bet that the majority of the people who are watching could not also pass that test. Yeah, there, uh, are one, there are 100 questions. You can you can go onto the Immigration Service website, USCIS.gov, and you can look up the 100 questions and quiz yourself. Uh, U.S. history, civics, geography, uh, government issues. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of basic stuff that you may have not looked at since you know you were in middle school uh, government class. Uh, that is all on the, the test, uh, as well as an English test. But the citizenship part process itself is the culmination of a lot of steps. So before you can even apply to become a U.S. citizen, you need to have a green card for at least five years. So you, oh, can't, just, know yeah, you can't just show up and say, I want to be a U.S. citizen. You need to first obtain a green card. And the green card processes are all these two-step processes where there's some type of qualification, an investment, a job, a family member, and then you actually apply, we call it the, the admissibility questions. Are, are you actually admissible as a green card holder? Did you enter lawfully when you were entering the country? Have you ever violated any previous status before, committing crimes, overstaying? And usually what happens is before that, people aren't often jumping right to green card. I talk to a lot of people, if they're here in the US, they're his visitors or students. That's the number one or two biggest things. They, especially in Orlando, they're, they have their vacation homes or a timeshare, they're visitors. They're coming a few months out of the year, they're enjoying the parks, they're, con they're contributing to our economy, they're going to the Mall of Millennia, they're buying expensive luggage, they're filling it with stuff and sending it home. They're already doing that, and then the, the switch flips for them. I have an opportunity to stay, or I want to find that opportunity to stay, contribute, I want to bring the business over, I want to make an investment to a business itself, I, I have this job offer, that's when the, the switch flips, and then I want to become something else other than a student or a visitor. 
month to get off of this back and forth thing. Right. So we find a, usually we find a temporary status for them, like an E2 visa, which is an investment-based visa, into a business that the immigrant will own. They will start or buy a business and operate it themselves. There's an L1 visa for a immigrant who owns or runs or manages a business abroad, and they're gonna come here and run a affiliate or branch or subsidiary of that business. And again, these all require some type of investment. It requires some type of job creation. It requires an actual real operating business. No one's just setting up shop and hanging out in their garage and pretending they're running a business. It's real, <laughs> it's real operating business. Uh, then usually from there, it's how do we convert that to a green card? Some folks jump right into green cards, like with an EB-5. Uh, it's expensive though. So you're trading this kind of direct path to green card with the fact that it costs $900,000 at minimum, right. which was only $500,000 back in November. For the first time since the program was created, they actually updated the wow. amount of costs. They had never updated it since it was created in the early 90s. So $900,000, it has to create 10 jobs and it also takes a long time right now, two to four years, and then you have to apply for a green card if one is available, sorry to those investors who are from China and India, where you have to wait an additional, sometimes several more years, wow. years to apply for a green card. We're talking about the money has been spent and invested and hanging out maybe four, five, six years before you can even say, can I get my green card now? Uh, and that investment has funded so many things, even in Orlando, can't see it from here, but, <laughs> Purple and gold, Orlando City Stadium. When they made that big announcement that we're not gonna take the city money, we're not gonna take the county money, well, guess what? That was EB5. That stadium was funded oh, by foreign was that investors. EB5? It was. I did not know Flavio, that. the owner, who was an EB5 guy himself, he, he thanked the EB5 investors on opening day. I'm sitting there in the stadium with my wife, and he says thank <laughs> you to the no EB5 idea. investors. I'm like, that's the thing, that's the thing that I do. That's the thing. She's like, Relax, man. I know. Relax, oh, be Sal. Cool. Be cool. Be cool. Uh, that's the thing. It's, that it's is so over. cool. So think about that, guys. All of you who are uh, love soccer, rough and tough, rough and tumble, love purple, love the city, love Orlando City soccer, EB5. EB5 funded that thing. Yeah. That's what EB5 means. Maybe, maybe they can buy Immigration. some better defenders or something or offense. I don't know. But <laughs> look, I love the team. Come on, guys, this is your year. Please, please, this is your year. <laughs> this is your year. All right, one quick question. Sure. Uh, that is pop culture before we head out. Mm. Um, I'm a, unfortunately a reality TV person because of my wife and my daughters. There is a recent case where there is a gentleman who was two or three years old when he came over here from Italy, and because of the crime and because he never went and did his citizenship, they have deported him. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what happens is you get in that pop culture, so that's all people think. Yeah. And so in their minds, they think, oh God, there's a whole bunch of two to three year old terrorists here uh, that are eventually going to kill us all and blah, blah, blah. Can you talk just for a second or two about that? Because I want to clear that up. Is that uh, Judy Che? Yep. Uh, I know Real Housewives. Real Housewives of New Jersey. <laughs> I know. Make it up. I know my pop culture. Uh, <laughs> so there, I mean, there are a lot of people who, and a lot of people think that the illegal immigrants in this country are just running across the border and hanging out. There are a lot of folks who are here without status. They entered maybe as very young people or they entered as teenagers or adults even, who just don't understand all of the processes and the rules. And they just, for the lack of knowing, and the lack of knowing how to find out, they overstay. Right. Their visitor status expires, their student status expires. They just, well, I've already established something here. I'm just gonna stay and figure it out. And unfortunately, there are people will hire people without documentation right. or there's ways to get around it, fortunately. Or just, I thought I was a citizen. I thought I was a permanent resident because my parents brought me here. Just, they had no idea. They don't know what they don't know sometimes. And they're here for maybe 20, 30, 40 years before realizing, oh, by the way, you were never a citizen. Right. And sometimes those, those cases work out where, oh, we, we find a way to figure it out. But sometimes they just don't. And like, sorry, that's the thing. And right now there's a policy of uh, these three and 10 year bars to reentry to get a little technical for a second. So if you stay beyond your status for between you know, more than six months, but less than a year, and you leave the country, you can't come back for three years. If you stay more than a year, you can't come back for 10 years. Wow. So that was the idea. The idea behind that, well, I get it. Uh, oh, well, it's, so, it's such a harsh penalty. It's so discouraging. People will leave. Well, unfortunately the opposite happened. Oh man, that's so severe. I'll just take my chances. Correct. And people just stay. So a lot of our, uh, with the number, I've heard anywhere between like 11 and 16 million on uh, people without status in the United States. A large chunk of them are gonna be people who entered legally, 
they entered with a visitor or a student or something and they just it's they weren't there. able to leave and we don't have a forced exit system it's not like someone from ice uh, immigration customs enforcement it's like they're coming knock on your door saying oh we have this record that this is the last address we have from you we saw that your status expires tomorrow so we're here to remind you to leave no it's 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 on the person who gets that status that stamp in their passport when they enter the country to know what that date is and either talk to someone like me to figure out the next steps or know that when that date comes make your way out but you want to talk to sal i want to talk to sal about all my stuff we're going to actually do something cool with sal coming up uh, so we're going to share all of his contact information, how you can reach out to him, how you can learn more. Um, if you're, you have an immigrant friend, if you're an immigrant, if you have any questions about anything to do with immigration policy, uh, I want you to reach out to Sal. You've got a great human being here. Obviously, he has a passion for what he's talking about. And so that always, to me, translates to a passion for you, which is what you want in your corner. You. We're big on mentorship here, so can you give a shout out to anybody who's helped you along the way, maybe somebody who changed your life, maybe impacted your life, could be family, could be professor. Um, you don't always have to say your wife because you know you're gonna say your wife at some point, you have to. Yeah. Uh, well, I love my wife too. Uh, so give that, give a shout out to some people. She is incredibly supportive and, and, and an attorney herself, so uh, it's, it's good to have someone in your corner who, who knows what you're going through. Uh, and it's been fun to be on that, this journey with her from the very first year of law school all the way to now. Uh, as spouses and parents, so and of course, hi Megan, uh, and she's oh, she's gonna love it. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and again, I, I've been fortunate to have uh, a really supportive family through this whole process. My dad, obviously, who's still watching, hey, I'm sure he'll show my mom later. Uh, you know, my my little brother who lives up in New York City, and he's always been fascinated by what I do and supportive. Uh, I already mentioned um, uh, Ed Bashara, who hired me right out of law school. Who I took a class with. It was my it was my one and only immigration class, and at a time where it was hard to find jobs. He said, well, you'll figure this out, right? And I'm like, all right, and I did. I was with him Love for a number that. of years. Uh, Carlos and Rustin at the firm I'm at now, they, they brought me on in December, and it's been a really great time, uh, really getting used to this new firm and uh, uh, seeing, seeing how they're doing things and a really good, comfortable, pro productive, professional. It's a really great uh, environment, so I'm really happy that uh, I'm there now. Uh, and then there's a really great immigration lawyer community uh, in Central Florida. I'm a member of the Orange County Bar Association's Immigration Committee. Uh, everyone on that uh, committee, uh, Nye from Bar, John Guyon, Ty Goe, there's so many great attorneys on that, um, on that committee that I could talk to about other issues. We brainstorm things all the time and support each other. Uh, the ALA Central Florida American Immigration Lawyers Association has a very active, very professional, incredible chapter here in Central Florida that covers everywhere from Tampa all the way up through Daytona, Jacksonville, they cover, it's really all of Central and even North Florida, but uh, incredible group of attorneys there who are all, again, very supportive, educational, we're all there helping each other out because we're really all in this together now. Uh, yeah. Immigration's been tough, man. Ooh, it's been tough. Uh, things have gotten harder, they've gotten more expensive, they've gotten less predictable than they ever have, so we are all fighting this fight together uh, for the benefit of everyone who's coming to this country to try to achieve that American dream and try to do it the right way, and we're all out there trying to trying to find that right way for them in a way that makes sense for them and their families and, and their hopes and dreams. I love it. All right, the American dream, immigration guys, reach out to Sal. Even Appreciate if you it. want to have you want to have him speak, my realtor friends out there. Yeah, uh, uh, Eva from Money Corp has been has Eva's been my tour amazing. manager. <laughs> She's uh, had me all over the place in the next Eva few months. Eva is a tour manager. All right, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having so me. This much. Been fantastic. We'll be back with Sal, obviously, at another point. We've got some ideas we're going to put together. Uh, we appreciate you guys. We will see you back here tomorrow. Mwah.